All right, welcome to the next episode of the Great Bible Challenge. Uh, this is a program that me and some pastor friends of mine work on to try to get people interested in the Bible. Uh, it's just a different way to engage people and especially to highlight uh, questions and things within the Bible that you may not normally put a lot of focus on. Uh, to look at some characters who maybe get overlooked, that kind of stuff. Uh, so it is a competition, and we have with us a few competitors today. Uh, so let me start by welcoming our judge. Uh, he's returning from the very first episode of this we ever did. Uh, Jesse, the judge, Haley, uh, pastor in South Dakota there in the U.S. Uh, Brother Haley wrote the rule book on how we judge these things uh, and so I'm glad to have him back uh, to be the judge tonight. I don't know if I should be glad because I am now also stepping in to take the place of one of the men because of the Internet issues. Uh, it has been a very interesting night getting ready to record these things uh, or record this as we have had every kind of technical difficulty you could probably have. Uh, maybe we can find at least one more. We'll see if we can fit it in somewhere. Uh, but I am now stepping in, and Brother Haley <laughs> didn't pick me last time, so I don't know if I should be glad anymore that he's returning. Uh, but uh, anyways, I, I am very thankful to have him. I'm also thankful to have my two competitors who, to be honest, if I'm going to step in, this is probably a bad time to do it because these two fellas uh, have both done this before, and they both killed it, uh, each of them. In fact, at this point, this is an interesting episode because it's the first time that everybody who's already arguing is a returning arguer. We've all done it before. Uh, and so let me start with the order that we are on the screen. And then we have uh, Brother Brian Dalkey. Brother Dalkey is a pastor there in Ohio in the States. Uh, and then we have Brother uh, Aaron Jenkins. Brother Jenkins is a missionary in Ireland, uh, not too far from me. So we uh, I appreciate the, these men who are joining us. I think it's going to be a great competition. Let me say these people are <coughs> times that they've argued this before i didn't do so well uh, I, I won one question that but that's 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 about as good as i get uh so we'll see how it lines up tonight uh, i look forward to it before we get into the questions let me try to rush through uh giving the highlights from the last one uh, i try to do that because i want you to be involved i want you to if you don't need to answer the polls and vote and all of this stuff if you're on facebook you know, leave us some comments get actively involved in what's going on uh, and in order to help uh, to encourage you to do that, I want to give you the highlights of the involvement from last time, as well as some of the questions and stuff. So last time we started off with the question of who was the greatest leader. Now, I'm going to admit I was the judge in the last video because I also had to step in as a substitute because last time the judge had technical difficulties and couldn't come. Uh, but I was uh, the judge last time. And so ultimately, I cited that Moses was the best answer that was given. Uh, however, Moses, Joshua, and Joseph were all valiantly argued, uh, given as very good answers. Uh, some answers that were given in the chat uh, were Noah and Paul. Uh, in the end, on this one, the audience actually agreed with me. In the polls, everybody agreed uh, that the answer should have been Moses. The second question that was asked was, who is, what was the greatest miracle uh, performed by Elijah? And so the answers that were presented were the calling down of fire, the stopping the rain uh, for three and a half years, and then the resurrection of the, uh, the widow's son, uh, or the woman's son, sorry, but uh, the resurrection there of the son. And so what you have with these three miracles uh, is that in the end, the people watching disagreed with me. Uh, this is the place where I was vetoed as a judge. It doesn't change anything because the judge gets the final decision. Uh, but at least the only <laughs> uh, that your opinion does get voiced and it does get heard. Uh, so actually, Brother Jenkins would have won last time because this was the question where he gave the answer of resurrection. Uh, and the audience come in and said that I was wrong, that Brother Jenkins should have won that point uh, and that the resurrection should have been uh, the accepted answer for there. The, there was no other extra answers really given. There were some things mentioned, but in the end, everybody <coughs> the miracles were the ones that should have been presented. The third question was, what is the most important fruit of the spirit? Uh, interestingly enough, in this case, it was unanimous before they ever even answered your questions, which means people didn't follow the rules. You have to wait until after the arguments are given. You can't base it off of your <laughs> uh, The answers were ever given. Everybody said faith. Uh, the answer of faith was picked based off of what was given. So he did win fairly and he did win in the polls. Uh, but the other two that were given were love and meekness. 
And then the last question from the last episode was which verse or passage best proves eternal security? The passages that were presented were 1 John 5, 11 through 13, uh, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, and Philippians 1, 6. So in the end, the answer that was chosen was 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Some other passages that were mentioned in the comments were uh, John 6, 37 through 40 and John 3, 16. Uh, the overwhelming agreement on that was also that it should have been 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Uh, so in the polls and in the comments, everybody agreed on that. Now, I give you that because I want to encourage you tonight that you're not going to override the judgment of Brother Haley, uh, but at least your voice can be heard and you can make people feel better. I mean, you see Brother Jenkins feels better already knowing that the, that the people thought he should have won. Uh, so he's the people's choice for last uh, last month's episode. But uh, I encourage you to get involved and to let your voice be heard. Let people know what you thought of the different uh, answers that were given. Give potential answers that you think uh, you would present if you were in this situation uh, for each of the questions that we're going to be asking tonight, uh, I encourage you to just be involved. It's a lot more fun if you get involved in this kind of thing. Uh, of course, it helps if you're watching live. You can get a lot more involved that way as other people will be doing that with you. Uh, and so with that in mind, I'll go ahead and introduce the questions for this episode. The questions for tonight Number one is, what is the most misused slash abused verse in the Bible? The second question is, what was the most significant of the Jewish feast? The third question is, who is the most interesting woman in the Old Testament? The fourth question is, what is the most dangerous cult slash sect? Uh, and then the fifth question is, what is the best passage warning against Halloween? I wanted to put that last question in, given that we are in the Halloween season. You know, we're in that time of year where it's coming up very soon. So I tried to put in some holiday related questions because of that. I also brought in the Jewish feast because if you follow that and understand, we've also just passed the time of year where two of the more prominent feasts that are celebrated today uh, have just taken place. So with those feasts in mind and then with Halloween coming up, that's why we've put those questions in uh, and we're hoping to get some good answers out of that. The others are just questions. I thought were some really good questions. I'd like to hear people discuss their, their beliefs on and give their answers to. So with that, we'll go ahead and get into our first question. What is the most misused slash abused verse of the Bible? The uh, most uh, abused verse in the Bible, in my opinion, is 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. The Bible says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on the, his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Uh, as a longtime pastor and somebody who grew up in church and youth group, uh, I have heard so many times from people who want to justify uh, making co choices that are, are carnal in nature, the way they dress, uh, they, they rebuff against standards that, uh, that are found in the Bible. And uh, they, they come to this verse and they say, well, God doesn't care about what is on the outside. He only cares about what's on the inside. And that's not actually what it says. It does say that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. That's true. But the context of this verse is that David is, or Samuel is, is there to anoint David as king. He's there to anoint the next king. God has sent Samuel the prophet there. And when David's oldest brother, Eliab, comes in. Eliab looks good. He looks like a king. He looks like what, uh, what Samuel would have expected to find. And God says, Samuel, don't look on his outward appearance. I'm not looking at his outward appearance. I'm looking on his heart. And God goes on to say, I've refused him. It's, it's not him. I'm looking for a man after my own heart. And, and it would be David. And David comes in. He's the youngest. And he's not the most obvious physical specimen 
investment or choice uh, for this. And so people take this verse and they say, well, I can be as I, I can be as carnal as I want to be on the outside because God only cares about the heart. Uh, when in reality, what the Bible is teaching is that you can be right on the outside. Really, the, this verse is teaching that you can you can wear a suit or you can wear a dress to church. You can carry a big King James Bible under your arm. Okay, I've chosen for the most misused or abused verse, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. And I believe that it is more misused uh, than the one that Brother Dawkey brought out because it is misused uh, by lost and saved alike. Uh, we often hear people, uh, like I said, both lost and saved alike say, only God can judge me. The Bible says judge not. And that really uh, shows us the misuse of this verse. Uh, they use it to deflect any kind of rebuke or criticism as judging it. They say that even taking the Bible and what the Bible says is right and wrong. Uh, the Bible has already judged it, but if I was to bring out Bible verses, they claim that I am doing the judging and they bring it back to this verse and say, judge not. People will say only God can judge me, which also should scare them, I believe. But, um, but if you, uh, point out sin, you're judging. If you uh, judge, excuse me, if you point out sin, you're judging according to this way of thinking. And so it's dangerous because sin must be brought out for salvation. So in reality, this verse is used to even deflect the gospel. If a person can't realize that they're lost and that they're a sinner, they're not going to be saved. Uh, the context tells us that this judgment uh, meant in this passage is that of condemnation, not discernment. Because even further in the same chapter, instruction is given to judge or to discern from the fruit in a person's life. So in summary, the Bible tells us that seconds. we aren't to condemn others, but by all means, we discern between right and wrong. And so I believe this is the most used and abused because it even keeps people from, from getting saved. It keeps Christians from growing. It uh, is a huge hindrance uh, all the way around, both for lost and saved and used both by lost and saved individuals. All right, and for my answer to this question, I'm going to be presenting uh, Romans 10, 13. Uh, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, very much we're picking up where Brother Jenkins left off. The reason why I feel this is such a significant verse and why it's misused is because of just the easy believism that's attached to it. This idea that many people just take the, the idea that if I've said a prayer, that's it without instituting with that also the need to actually believe that the need to actually have faith, you know, understanding you're a sinner, believing in Christ, confessing him as savior. Uh, all that stuff is in the context of this verse. It's all right there. I mean, he explains it in the verses leading into this, that if you believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, uh, it talks about believing that God has raised Jesus from the dead. It's all in the context. It's immediately there for us and available. And yet for some reason, people use this as an excuse to go knock on a door and, you know, do you want to go to hell? Well, no, I don't want to go to hell. Who wants to go to hell? Okay, then say a prayer after me. Uh, and then somebody says a prayer. We write it down on our list. I want a new soul to Christ. And we move on with our lives. Uh, this kind of mentality has seeped into soul winning. It's creeped into churches where people will stand in a room full of children uh, who don't even have the ability to begin to understand that there are sinners in need of a savior and ask them to raise their hand if they're scared of going to hell. If they're scared of going to hell because they raised their hand, then they will then ask them, please repeat after me and follow me in prayer, lead them in a prayer, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we understand the whosoever in this. We understand the whosoever in this is that anyone can do it. But we also have to understand in the context of this that it's not just that prayers are a magic spell. You know, this is not uh, witchcraft. This is not I said the right words and now I can go to heaven. It's something that must believe within the heart. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's not the simple act of calling. It is the belief and the, the things that are going in in the heart that are attached to that act of calling uh, um, that makes the prayer. Okay, so the question is, what is the number one misused or abused passage of Scripture? Uh, I'm going to go, it's, uh, they're all misused and abused passages of Scripture. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, number, the last one that was argued was uh, Romans 10, 13, Easy Believism. Definitely a misused passage of Scripture. Uh, the second one I'm going to mention, which is technically going to be the runner up. So pay attention. But uh, well, I'll go with the one that wins first then. 
the one that wins, man, the argument that wins, the verse that wins is judge not lest you be judged. Um, and the reason I say that, uh, you know, when, when the outward appearance one was brought up, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a, that's a good one that you hear over and over again. Um, you know, but I would say one thing that's interesting on that one as well, there's like, to me, there's almost another caveat because you mentioned that the verse itself proves opposite of the way that people use it because you, it, it goes the, the opposite of the way people, oh, God doesn't judge by the appearance. But it was proving that God looks at it from a different perspective. In other words, uh, there's people that take this to the other extent to where they do think that they're righteous by that way they look on the outside. Still, the verse is misused and abused, but the judge not, the reason it's powerful, the reason it wins is because it hurts the effectiveness of the message of the Bible, whatever it may be. If you disagree with it, you can just say, well, the Bible says judge not. Um, I mean, whatever you're trying to communicate from the word of God, um, whether it's salvation, whether it's you know, been a more effective Christian, things we ought to do, things we ought not to do, whatever the case is, um, the judge not thing. And when somebody says it, it's as if it totally removes your argument altogether. Like, yep, don't have to listen to you, judge not. So uh, that among the three is the number one, and it may just be the number one misused passage of scripture. So that one goes to Brother Jenkins. Yeah, I'll have to come in and agree on that, that, uh, I mean, in terms of verses in the Bible, that if we're going to talk about the sheer number of times people will misquote that, uh, there's a reason why after John 3.16, that's probably the most quoted verse of scripture. Uh, but of course, I ask everybody who's watching, you know, in the comments, let us know what you think. Uh, be sure to come in and support me and Brother Dalkey and, you know, not just Brother Jenkins. Uh, no, I, be sure to su support whatever answer you believe was best presented. That's always the rule is to pick the answer you believe was presented best. So now moving into our second question, then uh, we're going to be answering that question of what was the most significant of the Jewish feast. Uh, and so with this, we're going to, of course, rotate the order as we always do. Uh, and so this time, Brother Jenkins will be going first as he'll give us his answer to this question. I believe the most significant of the Jewish feasts would be the Passover, uh, because all the Jewish feasts point to Christ uh, at different aspects of his dealing with man. But the Passover most directly depicted Jesus' death in the place of the condemned to deliver them and to give them new life. Jesus was killed at the Passover, not at any of the other feasts. All the actions of the Passover outlined uh, Jesus' final week and everything leading up to the crucifixion. Even in the New Testament there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, it says that Jesus is our Passover. Uh, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said he was the lamb that would take away the sins of the world, which also pointed to the Passover. Uh, it was a feast of celebration of what God had already done, and all of the people participated it was a personal thing for all of them. It was a personal salvation. We can look at some of the other feasts, such as the Day of Atonement. It focuses on the sin of the nation and national cleansing. The sacrifices are bulls and goats, not a lamb. They cleanse the temple and the congregation, but not the individual. It was the priest that did the offering, not personal participation. And so it pictures, instead of salvation, it pictures cleansing of God's people during the tribulation. The Feast of Tabernacles is another one of the important ones, uh, but it remembers when God tabernacled with Israel in the wilderness and looks forward to when Jesus is going to rule and reign on the earth during the millennium. So I believe the Passover, as it uh, highlights salvation, it depicts salvation, it shows Jesus' death on our behalf. When we deserve death, he took our place. And so for that, the Passover is the most important of the Jewish feasts. All right, so I'll be presenting uh, what is now commonly referred to as Yom Kippur, but is the Day of Atonement. Uh, as you will have noted, as we go through these answers, Brother Jenkins has taken the time to address and introduce our answers for us. Uh, so I appreciate him introducing mine for me. It saves me a little bit of legwork in letting you know what it's all about. But when we look at these and we contrast the ones that are being presented and the significance of them, nobody's going to argue that the Passover is not significant because it is pointing us to Christ. The reason why I'm going to present to you the Day of Atonement was so significant and why it continues to be significant even today 
is because of this, that the Day of Atonement is a day in which they as a nation, and you understand God was working through Israel as a nation at that point, not individual local churches, that that nation was trying to get themselves right. It was a time of spiritual cleansing. It was a time to reflect on the things within their life, uh, an opportunity to look at their their condition and do something about it. Uh, the reason I feel it's so significant when we look at the long-term effect and how it carries is because Christ has given us a very similar uh, event for us as Christians to carry over in the New Testament. Uh, and that is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is an opportunity for a church and its individual members to come together reflecting on the sacrifice of our Savior and to do some spiritual spring cleaning, uh, to take an account of our own souls and deal with the whatever sins may have crept in and whatever problems may be there. Uh, and that's what the Day of Atonement was on a national level in many ways. It was an opportunity for Israel as a nation to come in and to do that spiritual spring cleaning. And in terms of significance, the very fact that God has taken something that is very similar, if not necessarily an equivalent, but very similar in its nature and carried it over to the church in the New Testament shows it is a necessary thing. It's a necessary event that from time to time we'll stop and do this spring cleaning, that it's not something uh, that's just meant to be a picture, but it's actually needed for the Christian life and for the believer in their spiritual life and condition. Well, I was considering which feast is the most significant. I, obviously, they're all important. But as we heard my other two competitors talk about um, the Feast of Passover, and actually there is no Feast of Passover. There is a Feast of the Passover, according to Scripture, which always points to the food, the actual feast that's taking place on the holiday of Passover. The Day of Atonement is also not listed as a feast, scripturally speaking, but it is a significant holiday. So if we limit our answers to the actual feasts mentioned in the Bible, the most significant to me is the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, which is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 13. And it's one of the three holy convocations, which means it's a time when all the Jewish males come together. Uh, they're required to come, present themselves before the Lord, make a sacrifice. It's a seven day feast. Uh, they were to build uh, tents or booths or tabernacles. And um, uh, they it was a reminder of the time they spent wandering in the wilderness and the lessons they learned, which are important to the believer, because when we are newly saved, the Lord is teaching us a lot of things before we move into the promised land and live by faith. Um, there are two Sabbaths attached to it. The first and last day are, are uh, holy days in which no work is to be done. So they're essentially uh, Sabbaths of rest and worship. And uh, it's celebrated every year by the people uh, so that they can constantly have that, uh, that reminder of what God did for them in the past and what God is going to do for them in the future. That time in the wilderness, that time of a believer being newly saved and growing and maturing in their faith, it's a very significant time for the believer and their development, their future walk with God, and the future life that they will have living in the promises God has given them. Wow. <laughs> Y'all really brought it out that time, man. That was so good. <laughs> the ruthlessness of Brother Jenkins uh, just like attacking yours right away was in incredible. Uh, but both of you responded incredibly well. Uh, you know, you talk about uh, the Day of Atonement. You just right away come after him. You come out with the feast uh, from Brother Dalkey. Uh, the distinction there. So uh, very good sparring back and forth there. Really impressive. Uh, so the sparring itself was like the best I've heard so far ever. Um, but man, as far as the argument, uh, wow. Okay. So where I think I have to go then is, oh my gosh. It's not easy to be judged sometimes. I know, man. I normally do pretty good at this, but the but the arguments are so good. Okay. I'll tell you, man, right here on the spot. Uh, the feast argument got me, man. It was just too good. It's actually the Feast of Tabernacles. I know they have a Passover meal, and they have a meal. But for that caveat alone, uh, 
answering what is the most significant Jewish feast, a seven-day feast um, that fits the category. Um, as far as an event, the meaning and so forth, the, the power of the Day of Atonement, the message of the Passover. Uh, but yeah, you got to eat the lamb. But as far as a feast, yeah, the Feast of Tabernacles. So I'm going with Dalkey on it. Just with that, just because it's a technicality. Uh, it's a technicality. But uh, still, he he wins on that. Our third question is going to be, who is the most interesting woman in the Old Testament? Who is the most interesting uh, you know, female there we find in the Old Testament? Uh, I want to do this just because we've highlighted men a lot. And so I wanted to force people to give attention to the female characters, which I've actually been surprised. Some men have chosen uh, ladies, even in Judges, when we were talking about the greatest judge, Deborah was chosen. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that I forced right. people into the box that they had to do that. Uh, and so I am going to be actually arguing this one first coming out the gate. So I'll be giving the first answer to this one. All right, so for my answer to the question, who is the most interesting woman in the Old Testament, I'm going with Esther. Uh, I mean, she is one of those two ladies who automatically stand out when you're asking questions about women in the Bible because she does have a name, a book named after her. But that's probably the least interesting thing about her. Uh, when you look at her story, it's an interesting story from beginning to end. It is a story that obviously they've made movies about it. They've done a lot to say about it because of the fact that you have this woman uh, who's being brought into this thing that seems like it's much bigger than her. And in the end, it becomes something so huge because she winds up being the savior for an entire nation of people. Uh, she finds herself in this position uh, wherein, you know, being married to the king, having went through what is essentially a beauty contest to win the position she's in in the first place. Uh, God then allows all these things. I mean, you think about a powerful verse. Mordecai's statement that God has allowed you to be born for such a time as this, uh, that then see God take all these pieces, moving them into place, shifting all these things, working in such an incredible way around this one woman uh, who is almost at times feels like she's in the background because there's so much focus on the events, on what Haman's doing, on her husband, on Mordecai. But it's all pivoting around her, just this young lady uh, who's been brought into this by God's providence. And God exalts her to this position. She's almost like unto Joseph, who's brought into this position so that God's prepared him for such a time as this to save much people alive. Uh, and so you see this woman who's brought this position and all comes to this culmination of her being used to save, her having the faith to approach the king being uninvited at the risk of her own life, her having the wisdom to put some pieces together and then being used to save the entirety of the Jewish people uh, so that her importance can never be underestimated. I mean, she was used to save the entire nation. Uh, it's an incredible story for loops and all these kind of things going around and even the king breaking his own decree that no man can break. The most interesting woman in the Old Testament, in my opinion, is Sarah, the wife of Abraham. And uh, what a what a woman she was and how she uh, laughed at God. Uh, literally, God was in her tent saying, you're going to have you're going to have a child. I know you're old, but you're going to have a child. And she laughed at him. And when the Lord calls her on it, she lies about it to his face. I mean, you imagine, I know those aren't good things, but they're they're interesting things. And yet God still uses her to be the mother of promise. She's the only woman in the Bible whose age at death is given. She was 127 when she died, according to Genesis 23. And in Galatians 4, as Paul is laying out the two covenants, he uses Hagar and Sarah as illustrations. Hagar being the, the bondwoman and her covenant of the law engendering to bondage. And yet Sarah being the covenant of promise that genders towards life and liberty and freedom. And, uh, and it's through Sarah that comes at 90 years old. She gives birth to the promised seed. 25 years they've been waiting for this boy. She gives birth to him. And from him comes Jacob. From him comes Joseph. Uh, and, and you see all of the nation of Israel sprout from this, this woman's womb who had been long past her childbearing years. And yet God uses her in, in a great way. And I, I think she's uh, interesting also because 
she's seconds. the one who comes up she's the one who comes up with a plan for Abraham uh, to marry Hagar and to produce a child outside the plan of God. Uh, and then when it happens, she's mad about it. And, uh, and yet through all of her faults, all of her failures, uh, she is still a, a mighty woman used of God, very interesting in, in her relationship to mankind and the scripture and how, uh, how God speaks of her going forward. Okay, for the most interesting woman in the Old Testament, I've chosen Ruth. Uh, as a Gentile believer, which I believe most people watching this will be, uh, Ruth is the most interesting uh, because she completely illustrates the church, the Gentile bride. Uh, her story is one of a destitute and hopeless widow who chooses to turn from the false gods of her people to the God of Abraham, and in doing so, finds the kinsman redeemer who pays her debts takes her to himself and provides for all of her needs. She even ends up in the lineage of Jesus Christ, uh, bringing in the Gentile nations there, extending uh, God's reach into uh, or beyond, I should say, beyond the Jewish people. And uh, not only is she a great depiction of uh, Christ and his church, but she also shows God working uh, through bad situations, uh, God taking the sins and bad decisions of one person, Elimelech, her father-in-law, and bringing blessings in spite of it and how God can work in spite of people's bad decisions. And it also shows that God is no respecter of persons, putting those who seem least likely into his family and his story. And so we see here that uh, Ruth really uh, pictures here being more than just a Jewish God, uh, but a God of all of the world. And we see the, the gospel and Jesus' reach uh, going out beyond just the Jewish people, but into all nations. And so Ruth, uh, to me, is one of the most significant, one of the most interesting uh, women in the Old Testament. So with Ruth as a Gentile bride, uh, we see her as being more interesting than the others that were mentioned, I believe, because, of course, uh, Sarah being a, a Jew, uh, Esther being a Jew, uh, they did have a reach, but this is where uh, uh, Jesus reaches out into the Gentile nations and it foreshadows how his church was going to go out into all the world. Okay. So uh, just a couple things to point out. Really cool. Uh, I love it as far as all three very interesting women. They're in God's word for a reason. Uh, thank God for the importance he places on women, even in the time all three of these been in the Old Testament to where uh, they weren't looked on that way by all. But uh, I love the, the appeal of Ruth with the Gentile believer side, the Gentile bride. Um, Sarah, as I was really getting drawn into uh, Brother Dawkey's argument, uh, I was getting drawn into that. And then I went back and looked and I said, man, she may be the most important woman. But that doesn't necessarily equate to the most interesting woman. And so, therefore, uh, Junior Haley gets it with oh, Esther um, because that's interesting stuff, man. Uh, you know, she she saved she saved the entire nation. She won a beauty contest. She became a queen. Uh, her background, um, yeah. So Esther's story. Esther is the most interesting. For this round, each answer is cut in half. Uh, we're only given one minute each to answer the question of what we think is the most dangerous cult out there. Uh, and so we'll see how the judge takes the, the question on this. We'll see how people define it, but uh, we'll go ahead and jump into this. We're going to change up the order of things. Uh, we're going to flip the, the order where I'll go ahead and go first on this. Uh, and then uh, Brother Jenkins will go next, and then Brother Dalkey will change up the order a whole lot. That way, the order of who's answering is less likely to affect anything. All right. So for the most dangerous cult, I decided I'm going to talk about the contemporary movement in this. I understand that we may get into arguments about how a cult is defined, but I'm just going to straight tackle because I only have a short amount of time to talk about this, why I think they're so dangerous. I think this movement is so dangerous because of the fact it hides. It doesn't look like a lot of the cults that are out there, yet they come in preaching their own Jesus, denying the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, they come in teaching men that God has no expectations, that going back to the questions of earlier of the most misused verse, that there is no judgment, going back to the the issue of 
easy believism and you know if you just say a prayer you get saved all the things that are attached to that and the way that is cheap and the way it has cheapened Christianity and made it so that people no longer feel a need to really turn to Christ with their hearts. They don't see a need to have any change within their life, any of that. I think it has had the most profound effect in modern Christianity. Okay, I believe the most dangerous cult or sect is Catholicism. I don't think that the uh, contemporary movement is actually a cult. It's more of a movement. It doesn't really have a head or a, uh, a central gathering or anything like that. But Catholicism is dangerous because it is large, it's well accepted, and it's considered Christian throughout, or even though it undermines all the teachings of Christ. It teaches works-based salvation, which is another gospel, and it appeals to man because man wants to save himself. It teaches idolatry. It makes man and not God and his word the final authority, and it re has repeatedly uh, perpetrated some of the most vile acts in history in the name of God, causing the lost to reject Christ because of this false Christian religion. Uh, in short, Catholicism is worldwide. It's influential. Those who follow or respect it are told a false gospel that's going to send them to hell. Those who see the wickedness in it reject it uh, and reject all Christianity, never seek the truth. I believe that Mormonism is one of the most dangerous cults and probably the most dangerous cult. Uh, they have a false Jesus that they worship, and yet they pass themselves off as being in line with, with Bible Christianity, and they're not. But what makes Mormonism more dangerous than Catholicism, in my view, is that Mormonism is evangelistic in its, in its basis, whereas Catholicism really is not. Catholicism has dominated people through force, and its adherents are not very dedicated. But at the same time, Mormonism in, uh, requires missionary work and evangelism, and uh, they are actively proselytizing, and they do a lot to take people away from sound Bible churches. They take them away from other religions. They're active all around the world, and they're they're endeavoring to convince people of the legitimacy of their uh, of their beliefs, even though they are they're close in some things, but they're totally wrong about Jesus Christ. Okay, the question is, what is the most dangerous cult or sect uh brother haley was called out for talking about the contemporary movement not a cult but it could be considered a sect uh for sure so there's uh doesn't totally discount the question uh the most dangerous cult or sect the argument there is one by brother jenkins again on catholicism uh you know, teaches works, which is denies the work of the cross, uh, works for salvation, the idolatry. Um, he, he mentioned um, dangerous. We're talking about dangerous because, of course, the most important aspect is the spiritual aspect. But he mentioned the vile acts, the literal danger. I mean, uh, there is persecution and death that's followed uh, Catholicism throughout the years. But I got to say that the argument given by Brother uh, Dalkey, uh, the Catholicism, Brother Jenkins wins the argument, but it was just by hair. Uh, the evangelistic nature, the argument for the evangelistic nature, the dedication by its adherents uh, is uh, what was a great, great argument. But uh, ultimately, the, the fact that Catholicism is accepted as Christianity, Mormonism really isn't, the contemporary movement obviously is, but uh, yeah, Brother Jenkins wins with Catholicism. All right. So for our last question, we will be jumping straight into the question about what is the best passage warning against Halloween. Uh, we do want to try to, to recognize since the holiday is coming, we want to go ahead and offend everybody equally at one time by talking about it. Uh, but no, we want to talk about some things that are timely. Uh, so we'll be getting into this question. Uh, just so everybody knows what's at risk going into this is currently Brother Jenkins is leading by one point. I have one point. Brother Dalkey has one point. So Brother Jenkins has two. Uh, if that wasn't uh, clear the way I expressed it. Uh, so if one of us can pull out the win on this one, it means we do have to go into some form of sudden death, some tiebreaker. This will be all brand new territory for us, uh, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, if Brother Jenkins gets this, then uh, it'll be very impressive. Uh, so we're going to see how that goes uh, as we get into this question. Okay, for the best passage warning against Halloween, I've chosen uh, Ephesians chapter 5, 7 through 11. It says, Be ye not therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, 
but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Uh, the Bible says there, you are in darkness now in light. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Uh, Halloween is a clear celebration of that which is dark. Uh, even if many people try to make it cute and less demonic, uh, we can clearly see the movies, the decorations, uh, the costumes, all of it glorifies death, demon sorcery, and the occult. Uh, even if we ignore its clearly pagan origins, uh, it is still a celebration of darkness. And Ephesians 5.11 tells us to have no fellowship with the unfruitful or the worthless works of darkness. And so why would a Christian want to partake and celebrate in uh, something that is clearly dark and demonic uh, for a Christian to go out and to parade and to take part in this would be joining hands with this. It would be going along with it. It would be following the traditions of uh, many of the cults of the Catholics that we just looked at in Christianizing something that was pagan, something that was uh, used to celebrate Satan for years. And now we are simply uh, adding that in. We are going along with it. We seconds. are uh, growing uh, cold and complacent against these things that are uh, definitely dark. We have uh, kind of been lulled to sleep about the, the spiritual aspect, the spiritual realm that is around us. And we think that we can go out and uh, hold hands with the darkness and not be affected by it. But we can clearly see throughout scripture the effect of whenever God's people uh, joined in with those who were against God, those who were in darkness. So the Bible tells us have right. no fellowship with their unfruitful works. I chose 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18 that say, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. <clears throat> Halloween doesn't have its origins in anything biblical, anything glorifying God, or anything that uh, brings honor to the Lord. It has its roots in paganism and Satanism, has its roots in, in the worship of, of spirits and, and idols. And uh, the Bible says there's just no agreement. How can there be any agreement between God and idols? How can there be any agreement between the Holy Spirit of God and the spirit of wickedness that is out there. The Bible tells us very clearly that we are not to have any agreement, any any concord with them and participating in what they are worshiping and what they're celebrating. And granted, many people are just out for the candy. They're just out for their kids to have a good time. But the Bible says that we are to come out and be separate and we are not to touch the unclean thing. Uh, we have to be very careful what we dirty ourselves with. And if we are touching things that are unclean, it makes us unclean. And when we participate in things, even when we do it in an seconds. innocent type of way, uh, where we, you know, that some churches are doing things like trunk or treat or, or things that are Halloween alternatives, they still have that Halloween feel to them, dress up in costumes, get candy kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't want to be a part of the world. I don't want to bring the world into the church. And I don't want anything that is uh, nasty and stinking about the world to, to rub off on me. And so I want to be separate so that as the scripture says that God can be a father unto me. All right, for my passage, I'll be looking at Acts 19, verse 16 through 19. It's a story that's always stood out to me very much when talking about these ideas. Uh, we'll pick up with verse 16 where it says, And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this man, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and the fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Uh, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The greatest warning I see in this is not so much just the simple warning that we need to be separated from darkness, but what I see in the extension of this. 
uh, that we see this story of these Jews who are trying to exercise a, a devil out of a man. The devil, it's such an incredible story as he's saying, you know, Jesus, I know Paul, I know, but you, I don't. And he jumps on the men. They run out of the house uh, naked. And the story was so incredible to those that heard it. They finally saw evil for what it was and realized how dangerous and deadly it is to play with these kind of things and to not take evil things seriously. And so the noise goes throughout the city and the people who hear it, they come in and they start burning their books, their witchcraft. They start turning over this, all these things, you know, that they have that has connected them to this evil. Evil, they start to get rid of this. And you see that as they get rid of this, as within their life, there is this moment wherein they choose that they're going to surrender their lives to Christ and they're going to serve him and they're going to take it whatever the cost, even if it's thousands of pieces of silver, uh, even if it means giving up a certain lifestyle and comforts that are afforded to them in their community, they're used to, they're going to get rid of all of that. And when they did that, that's when the word of God was able to prevail in that area. It shows you the danger of it. And it gives you such a profound warning because it's not just that we should be separate. It's not just that we have to give the, you know, the appearance of these things, but that in not doing it, we are hindering the word of God working in our lives. We are robbing the power out of the church where the word of God could prevail in our area as well. The word of God could grow mightily and be preached to those around us so profoundly. If we would just sell out to Christ and get rid of these things, these evil things that have creeped in. So, uh, yeah, man, all very compelling arguments. Uh, I would, uh, the example given in Acts, obviously, is, is a great one versus, you know, con considering the comparison to witchcraft and the example given there. Um, but I'm really torn between the passage in Corinthians as well as Ephesians. But I've got to say the one that just seems the most cut and dry and therefore the best passage warning against Halloween I would have to go with Brother Jenkins and Ephesians 5, 7 through 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Um, cut and dry, pretty simple. Thought it was great. We have our official winner for the, the fourth episode of the Great Bible Challenge. Brother Jenkins has come back, and uh, this time he really has killed it. Uh, first person to ever do that. Uh, so now we have to set him up against Brother Hoffman, who is the only person to have won multiple episodes, uh, and we'll see who falls. Uh, but I really appreciate I think uh, these fellows did a great job. I very much appreciate them sticking it out through all the technical difficulties and everything that went. Bro, Jim, could you go ahead and celebrate now as you're the official winner? You know, this, this is your opportunity to, to be excited. Uh, all right, so we have that official win. Uh, I'm very excited with what's happened here and what's all has been brought out. I think it was all very good. Uh, I know the video is a little bit longer because we added a little bit more to it. I tried to keep some stuff shorter to accommodate for that. And one of the big things I'm going to keep shorter is I'm not going to say much as we get ready to close this out. Uh, so I ask you to like, share, all that kind of stuff. Subscribe if you're on YouTube, whatever, because it helps you to get these kind of videos. And that's what we make them. I don't make them for people to not see them. Uh, I make them so that you can actually get them. But uh, I do appreciate you participating. I encourage you, if you haven't participated at this point, go back and put your answers in the, the comments. Let us know what your answer to each question would have been, what answer you thought should have won, uh, any notes or ideas you have about these things. I encourage the communication uh, in the comments because it does add a lot of fun to doing these kind of videos. Uh, so thank you again to uh, each of my guests who've been a part of this and make these kind of videos uh, possible, who take the time out of their days to always join join us and do this. Uh, and of course, thank you to our returning judge, Brother Jesse Haley, uh, for coming in to, to pass judgment on all of this. Uh, be sure if you disagree with him, though, let him know that in the comments. That's that's, yeah. that's what you have to do. No. Uh, thank you, though, to everybody. I hope you have a good evening. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next month at the next episode of The Great Bible.